Hello everyone, and welcome to the series on optimization methods. In this series, we're going to be going through a variety of different scenarios for which we want to optimize some system. Those systems could either be linear, nonlinear, discrete, continuous, deterministic, or probabilistic, or a combination thereof. So we're going to be starting off with the basic linear, discrete types of systems for which we want to optimize, and then we'll slowly build the tools in order to generalize to the more, say, continuous um, stochastic types of processes for which you might encounter in the real world. So let's just start off by giving a little example that you can actually visualize in two-dimensional space. So consider the system of inequalities given by the following uh, statements. In particular, let's consider 3x1 plus 6x2 is less than or equal to 15, 2x1 plus 7x2 is less than or equal to 14, with the conditions that x1 be greater than or equal to 0, and x2 also greater than or equal to 0. So technically we have four inequalities with two variables, x1 and x2. You could also write this as xy if you um, don't like the subscripts on these variables, but we're going to be extending this to several different variables. So, you know, of course we can do like xyz, um, but of course then the letter choice becomes a little bit um, complex. So let's introduce a bit of terminology that we're actually going to be using with a lot of these discussions. So the first term that we want to talk about is these x's. So these xk's is usually referred to as decision variables. Okay. For example, you can think of, for example, x1 is the number of donuts you sell, x2 is the number of coffees you sell at a particular business. 3, for example, as the price of a donut, 6, for example, as the price of your coffee, and let us assume that the total price must be less than or equal to $15. For example, you might be doing like a combination or a sale or some type of structure uh, in that particular restaurant business. So these X's are going to be uh, our decision variables. For example, how many coffees do you need to sell um, to maximize uh uh, profit or how many you know times do you need to eat outside in order to minimize stress or something along those lines. Uh, this, um, we can also represent these X's in matrix form. For example, we're going to actually be looking at a lot of these things from the perspective of linear algebra because it's going to make so many things easier because we can have X1, X2, X3 down to say Xn for example, so n decision variables. So we're actually going to look at just x to be our vector of decision variables. So x is typically going to be represented as a vector in the form x1, x2, all the way down to xn. And we're going to be calling this the decision, the decision vector which is gonna store all of our decision variables within them. So these inequalities associated to these decision variables are usually called constraints and restrictions. So the set of inequalities, or they could be equalities as well, because you know we can change these less than or equal to, to for example, equals to, or not equals to, or something along those lines, are called constraints and restrictions. And we'll differentiate, differentiate between constraints and restrictions in just a moment. So now let's take a look at a closer look at these particular um, inequalities and uh, constraints and restrictions for which we have here. So if we look at this from the y equals mxb perspective, which sometimes is viewed as the easier way to sort of graph um, systems of linear inequalities. So in a sense, we have 3x plus 6y. So usually we like things in the form of y equals mx plus b. So I'm just going to be solving these inequalities for that second variable. And that's going to give us an equivalent representation of these uh, linear inequalities. So we're going to have x2 is less than or equal to negative one half x1 plus five thirds. And then for the second, we're going to have x2 is less than or equal to negative two sevenths x1 plus two. And we still have our x1 greater than or equal to zero and x2 are greater than 
or equal to zero. Okay, one could call this, for example, A1 to be the first inequality or the first constraint revolving around our decision variables, and we can call this, for example, A2, which is going to be our second row associated, or you could call, for example, that A1 and that A2, because eventually we're going to be writing these in matrix, uh, matrix form, so it's like the first row or the second row of our, you know, our constraint matrix, per se. Right? Now that we have these things in, say, y is less than or equal to mx plus b form, now we should be able to easily graph these solutions, or these inequalities, rather. So if we graph uh, a1, notice that we have a y-intercept of 5 thirds. Um, so that's like, you know, 1.6666 that's repeated. So that's going to be somewhere along these lines. So it's going to be a downward slope because it's a slope of negative 1 half. So let's draw that as, for example, um, a1. Yeah, let's let that be a1. And then we have 2, which is going to be located uh, a little bit higher, right? And that's going to have a more shallower slope. So technically, what I can do is, actually, I want to rename my variables here. Let's actually graph these uh, conditions in this particular way. So let's let that be a2 and let this be a1. We're just sketching these values here um, just so you get a general idea of what we're looking at. And we also have these x1 greater than or equal to 0, x2 greater than or equal to 0. So if you look at all of these inequalities with respect to each other and consider all of the points for which those lines intersect with each other, then you should see that the solutions to the systems of inequalities is located in that polygonal region uh, shaded in green. So what is this area shaded here? So this is the set of all solutions to the system of inequalities. Now, some people will call that the feasible region, but we have no, you know, optimization function for which we seek to optimize. Um, so there's nothing feasible about optimization if we have nothing to optimize yet, right? But this is eventually going to be called the feasible region once we have an objective function that we actually seek to optimize. So let's give it a brief introduction in terms of what an objective function actually is. So an objective function, which we're going to be denoting by f of x here, and keep in mind x is not a variable in the classical pre-calculus sense, x is going to be representing a vector that's going to contain all of our decision variables x1 through xm. So this is not a at least basic function in the pre-calculus sense, but it's actually a vector function. Um, but nonetheless, the right-hand side of you know the f of x is equal to is some statement that revolves around you know x1 through xn, or possibly even some other things. But this functional, which some people also call it, is a statement for which we seek to optimize, where optimize could either be a maximization problem or a minimization problem based on the constraints or restrictions of the decision vector x for which we talked about before. So let's actually bring back that system, but let's also introduce an objective function for which we may want to optimize. So let's assume our goal is to maximize the function f of x1, x2 is equal to 3x1 plus 4x2 plus 5, subject to the constraints 3x1 plus 6x2 is less than or equal to 15, 2x1 plus 7x2 is less than or equal to 14, with the restrictions on the values of our variables x1 to be that x1 must be non-negative and x2 also must be non-negative, right? So you're going to actually see these three component uh, components associated to linear programming very, very often, okay? So what do we have here going on? So we have this function with our decision variables for which we want to optimize. In particular, our goal is to maximize this particular functional of x1 and x2. So this is our objective function. And then we have these two linear inequalities. So these are our constraints, but in particular, they are our linear constraints. And we also have our linear restrictions. 
You could put other restrictions on x1 and x2. For example, you can be like, okay, the absolute value of x1 um, must be between you know 5 and 6 or something along those lines. So the restrictions and constraints definitely can take a more complex structure, um, but if you have the objective function, the constraints, and the restrictions for your particular um, variables, then those three structures together is usually what we refer to as a linear program. So a linear program is three statements combined, an objective function, constraints, and restrictions. So let's take a look at what we have here for our inequalities and our restrictions, and let's sort of see how we can maybe solve this uh, linear program. So let's bring back our picture, but let's actually only show uh, the solution region. So remember, our solution region had this polygonal type of shape. That's not a vertical line, so let's draw it a little, just a little bit slanted there. Okay, so this, again, was the solution to our linear inequalities, but it's also now got a new name because it's our feasible solution or a feasible region for solutions solutions to the linear program. Some people also write LP to abbreviate linear program, right? So it's a feasible region because now we have an objective function for which we seek to optimize. Therefore, now we have a set of points in particular two-dimensional space um, for which contain all of our possible, because that's pretty much what feasible means. It's just a set of possible um, solutions, or it's the set of all possible solutions for which could be solutions to our optimization problem, provided that the actual solution does exist, and possibly it's not even unique in this particular sense. So what are actually these points? So you should be able to find them on your own with a little bit of Gauss joint elimination, possibly. So obviously this point here is going to be 0, 0, 0, 2 is going to be that point there. Uh, this other point, this vertical uh, or x-intercept is going to be 5, 0. And then that corner point there is going to be 2.3 repeated, comma, 1.3 repeated. And usually these corner points can be generated, say, via Gauss-Jordan elimination. Gauss-Jordan elimination uh, doing pairwise uh, uh, for example, reduce rational forms for linear equations definitely is going to be a common tool when you're working with linear programs. Of course, when you start working with nonlinear programs, then you have to use more sophisticated methods. Okay. Now, um, what about the minimization of our particular functional? So remember that our functional that we seek to optimize, fx1, x2, was equal to 3x1 plus, what was it, 4x2 plus 5. And our main goal was to maximize this. But what if our goal was to actually minimize this functional? What would be the solution to it? So notice that this curve is always increasing because we're assuming that x1 and both x2 are positive. Therefore, this is a non-negative quantity. In particular, the minimum value for which this can have is actually going to be 5 because the minimum values for x1 and x2 are both going to be equal to 0. So the minimum value for which x, f, x1, x2 could be will be equal to 5. So what solution generates that minimization of our functional? Well, that's going to be minimized. So it's minimized at the point 0, 0, which is located on the boundary of our feasible region. Right? And therefore, that minimization solution, so that is our solution, and the minimal value of that, so the minimum value of f in that case is going to be equal to 5, because that's what you get when you plug in 0, 0 into that particular functional. Now, if we plug in the other boundary points of our feasible solution, what will we get? Because we know if we plug in any of these points, the value for which we're going to plug in at 0, 2 is going to be a little bit more greater. Similarly, if we plug in numbers along that particular line, the functional value that we get at that corner point is also going to be greater. And of course, there's no other value on the solution there that's going to be less than it. So plugging in values along these boundaries is always going to give us a functional that's greater as we move vertically up that feasible region domain. So where is the maximum value going to be located for this feasible region? You should be able to see that it's definitely going to be located on the boundary of our feasible region. Now that's not 
always the case. This feasible region does have to have some geometry restrictions, um, but for this particular example, looking on the corner points of a feasible region is definitely a good place to look, and you can even try some intermediate uh, green point regions just to sort of test that conjecture. So if we plug in our other corner points into our function, what will we get? So f of 0, 2, which is our y-intercept, is going to be equal to 3 times 0, plus 4 times 2 plus 5, which is going to come out to 13, because it's um, 4 plus 8, which is uh, uh, 4 times 2, which is 8, plus 5 is 13. If we plug in 5, 0, that's our x-intercept of our feasible region, that's going to be 3 times 5, plus 4 times 0, plus 5, which is going to come out to 20. 5 times 3 is 15, plus 5 is uh, 20. And if we plug in the corner point that's sort of located in quadrant 1, that's going to be 7 thirds, 4 thirds as a fraction, and once you plug those points in, that's going to come out to approximately 17.33. So if we look at each of these points, where is the maximum solution located? We clearly see that 13, 20, and 17.33 are all positive numbers, um, but which one is the maximum? We see that 20 is the greatest among these of the three. So that means 20 is the maximum value of f with respect to our constraints and restrictions, that means 5 comma 0, the point that generated that maximum, is the solution to our linear program. And you can use some um, geometry logic to sort of justify that no other point within that physical region is actually going to give you a higher value other than 20 based on the solution uh, restrictions and constraints for which we have imposed on that particular linear program. Now that we have some of the general insights and terminology associated with linear programs and linear programming as a whole, let us see if we can try to generalize some of those principles so we can build a nice sound theory on it so we can possibly extend that to more complex structures for which we seek to find the solution to. So a good starting point is looking at the objective function, which is usually consisting of only one uh, statement. Now, of course, you can have objective functions or a system of objective functions that need not be linear, but let's just focus on the one objective function that is linear just to make things easy for now. So the objective function, at least for the linear case, can be represented in the form f of x, where x is equal to x1, 2, 3, 4, down to say xn, can be represented in expanded form as c1x1 plus c2x2, all the way down to say cnxn, where these c's are, let's say, real numbers. Of course, you can bring in uh, complex numbers if you want, but let's just keep them as it is. And notice I am not including a constant at the very end, for example, a c n plus one. For example, you can't have just a constant sort of hanging out at the end. We'll discuss that momentarily, but for now, let's just assume that we do not have that or we do not need that. So if we have that expression, uh, expression, how can we express that in linear uh, algebra form? So what we're going to do is we're going to define a new vector c. c is going to be equal to the vector containing those constants, so c1, c2, down to cm, and we are of course going to define our decision vector x to be equal to x1, x2, all the way down to xm. So if you remember from basic linear algebra, if we do c transpose times x, that's actually equivalent to doing c times uh, c dot product x, which is equal to c1 x1 plus c2 x2, all the way down to c n x m, which you can write in uh, compressed form as the sum from k is equal to 1 to n of c k xk. So that's what we can write, at least in express form, as c transpose x, right? Which is again equal to our objective function that we first started with, right? So now we have a very compact, uh, compact way of expressing an objective function. So let's actually formally state what we have here. So that means any linear objective function can, or objective function of a linear program, can be written 
in the form f of x is equal to c t x. Right? Very, very nice. So different linear programs might have different z's, might have different x's, they might have different lanes, but nonetheless they can be written in this compact form. So now let's introduce a question that we actually mentioned just a brief moment ago. So can our functional f have a non-zero intercept? So in particular, suppose we have g of x is equal to 3x1 plus 4x2 plus 5, the same functional that we had before. So how do we deal with this functional if we want to write it in that particular form? So it's very important to note that this is just a vertical shift of g where the original function that we're shifting is actually just 3x1 plus 4x2. So g is just a vertical shift of some other function, let's call it f. So what we can do is we can define f of x to be equal to 3x1 plus 4x2, which means that g of x is just going to be equal to f of x plus 5. So once we do that, you should be able to use just basic geometrical logic or geometrical proof to verify the following statement. In particular, that f and g are optimized at the same value of x, and keep in mind x is a vector, x1 and x2 in this particular scenario. The only difference is the value for which they are um, optimizing. For example, if this is optimized with a value of 8, that means that is going to be an optimized with a value of uh, 13. Okay, So just keep that in mind, they are going to be optimized at the same exact place. Um, therefore, instead of optimizing g, we can just optimize f, because what we're looking for is the x values that solve that linear program, not necessarily the value for which that um, gives us in terms of an optimal value of f. Right? So that is the answer to that, you know, can you have a 9-0 intercept function? The answer is yes, of course, um, but since we're solving for x here, we don't really care about the value for which um, x produces in terms of optimality. We just care about the value of x, therefore we can just optimize the functional that does not have an intercept, and therefore we can always represent our linear objective function for a linear program in that nice com compact form as ctx, as we mentioned briefly before. Now that we know how to compactly represent the objective function for our linear programs, now let's take a look at the constraint equations. So let's assume that all of our constraint equations are in the form less than or equal to with no uh, decision variables on the right hand side of those inequality symbols. Now you may think, well, what if I have equals to, or what if I have greater than or equal to instead of less than or equal to? Later we're actually going to show how to represent all of them in a particular way, so we can actually convert between less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, and equal to by introducing some other variables, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But now let's just keep things a little bit simple, and let's assume that they've actually all been written in this form less than or equal to um, some constant, let's say. And let's just also assume that they're all linear uh, inequalities. So no x1 squared, no absolute value of x2, no square root of xn, or the sine of xn minus 1, nothing crazy like that, just so some uh, linear transformations. So if I want to represent this in matrix form, notice that I have 1, 2, down to m equations. So I have m equations and I have n unknowns. There's no mandate that we have to have the number, same number of equations and same number of unknowns. Yes, of course, if you have those things and um, these equations behave nicely with each other, then sometimes you have a unique solution and it always exists. But that's not always the case. Um, sometimes, even if you have more equations than unknowns or more unknowns than equations, even those cases sometimes have um, unique solutions and sometimes they exist for our optimization problem. So let's just you know assume that m and n are just arbitrary uh, positive integers, and then we can look at the special cases a little bit later on. So we can actually represent these systems of inequalities in matrix form because we know that at least this left-hand side can be written written in matrix form as a11, a12, all the way down to a1m, and then a21, a22, that should say a12, 
a11, a12 down to a1n, then a22 down to a2m, and then that's going to continue all the way down to am1, am2, all the way down to amn. So that's going to be, say, some matrix A, which has the dimensions m by n, so m, roll, m rows and n columns. And then we're going to have our decision vector, x1, x2, all the way down to xm, which is going to be an n by 1 vector. Keep in mind that these dimensions must match, and that's going to produce a m by 1 vector at the end. And that m by 1 vector is going to be these b's. So that's going to be equal to b1, b2, all the way down to bm. And that, of course, should be less than or equal to, at least in our present form. That's what we're aiming for. Right? Therefore, if we have A in our first definition, there we have X, and there we have a new vector, let's call it B, then we have AX is less than or equal to B. So that means we can write our constraint inequalities uh, can be written as AX is less than or equal to B. Right? Now, just keep in note that this less than or equal to sign could be greater than or equal to, or exactly equal to. Or if we get really interesting things, we could have non equal to, but in order to compactly represent them in a matrix form, they should all be the same exact sign. Some people will even break these into different matrices the matrix with the less than or equal to, a matrix for the greater than or equal to, and a matrix for the equal to. That's perfectly fine, but of course, the structure of your linear program becomes a little bit more complex when you do that. So let's just take a look at what our linear program now looks like in our compact form. So remember our linear program is going to have three scenarios. In particular, our goal is to optimize our functional fx is equal to ctx subject to the following constraints. AX, for example, we can say it's equal to B. Let's assume we can translate less than or equal to into equal to form. And then we have our restrictions. Right? And let's assume that our X values are greater than or equal to zero, for example. Right? So we have our optimization function or our objective function. We have our constraints and we have our restriction. So OCR, that pretty much constructs or represents your linear program in the general sense. Now that we have some tools on how to compactly represent our linear programming problems, now let's look at some of the common tricks that are used to convert, for example, less than or equal to constraints into equals constraints, and how to convert, for example, a maximization problem into a minimization problem, and some of the other tricks that we're actually going to use to sort of create a nice sound theory for linear programming. So restrictions, at least in the literature, are typically taken to be constraints on the values of x. For example, you can say that we only want x1 to be non-negative values. We want x2 to be, be, not be non-positive values. We want x3 to be always greater than or equal to 5. And we want, for example, x4 to be anywhere between, say, negative 5 and 5, inclusive of the boundary, um, including 0 uh, in between. Okay, which can be represented as an absolute value. Uh, of course, the easiest ones to deal with are this and this, and you should be able to think about how to easily transform x3 is greater than or equal to 5 into one of the other two very, very easily. And we'll talk about this last one a little bit later, and we possibly will investigate more complex constraints on variables a little bit later as well. Now, one very important thing to notice is we do not have to restrict um, our decision variables at all. For example, we can have a linear inequality, um, for example, x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to 5, so that would belong to our constraint category, and we can only mandate that x1 be greater than or equal to 0, and sort of leave x2 to be whatever it wants to be. So x2 can be, you know, 500, x2 can be 0, x2 can be equal to negative 6.3, we don't care. So in those particular scenarios, we usually call x2 an unrestricted variable. Now that's actually going to pose a problem because we want all of our variables to be restricted, at least in our formalization of the compactification of those linear programs. So one can ask, well, is it possible to transform unrestricted variables into another 
restricted variable or maybe even a set of restricted variables? The answer is yes. So let's actually go into um, how we would go about doing so. So in order to transform or convert an unrestricted variable to a set of restricted variables, what you can do is you can create two other variables. So let's assume that xk is unrestricted. So if xk is unrestricted, what we can do is we can define this to be equal to a new variable called, say, xk plus uh, minus xk minus. So these are two new variables, two new variables. And in addition, we can mandate that these two new variables be restricted, in particular, xk plus and xk minus are both greater than or equal to zero. And one should be able to show that um, regardless of the value of x you have, there always exist these two numbers, xk and xk minus, that will give you whatever value you want. For example, if xk is a positive number, um, that means xk minus is less than xk plus. If you want xk to be a negative number, that means xk minus is greater than xk plus. And you can easily do that even if both of them are positive numbers. So you should be able to get any real number from the linear combination of two positive numbers. So you can always create um, restricted variables based from unrestricted uh, variables, one, two, or even many. So that's the first easy fix that we can do. Well, what about the optimization thing? Is it possible to transform a maximization problem into a minimization problem? The answer is, of course, yes. So let's assume we have um, this function here, which is, let's do just do a basic parabola to sort of get some insight here. Uh, and let's assume that our goal is to maximize g. So our goal is to maximize um, g of x, right? So if I want to convert this into a minimization problem that has the same exact solution but is a minimization problem, notice that I can just perform a vertical or a, or a reflection about um, the horizontal x-axis. And I can easily do that by negating g, right? So that's minus g. And I actually can give that a name. I can call that, for example, f. So the maximization problem of maximizing g is equivalent to minimizing f of x, where f of x is equal to minus g. So if you have, for example, some functional, um, and say our goal is to maximize, say, negative 3x1 plus 5x2 um, plus, say, 7, then we can actually convert this into a minimization problem of minimizing 3x1 minus 5x2. And notice that I am intentionally leaving off 7 because with the minus seven technically there, it actually has the same exact solution, x1 and x2, provided that the minimization problem actually does have a solution. It just has a different functional value at that particular solution, right? So that's how you can always cal can, uh, convert a maximization problem into a minimization problem. Now let us assume that this expression is one of the inequalities that we have in our constraint section of our linear program. And in particular, let's focus on the fact that maybe this has a less than or equal to sign. Let's assume that we want to convert this into an equality um, because then we don't have to worry about you know shaded regions. We can actually just look at the lines and see where those lines intersect. So equality sometimes is a lot easier to deal with compared to inequalities. So if this is our goal, in particular to convert this into an equal sign, and we want to preserve pretty much everything, what we can do is we can actually represent this as instead ak1x1 plus ak2x2 plus all the way out to aknxm. Now notice that this sum is less than or equal to bk, but I want it to be equal to bk. That means there's some positive deficiency between these. So if I add some number to this expression, which should exist because all of these are real numbers, then I should be able to generate the value of bk. But also keep in mind that x1, x2, and xn are all going to be variables. That means I cannot just add a constant. I have to add a positive variable into this expression as well. So what I can do is I can add this variable, f, for example, called xk, and that will make this expression equal to bk with the additional restriction that x uh, sk must be greater than or equal to zero, right? So this is our constraint section and this is what our re restriction 
will then introduce, you know, of course we have x1, x2 down to xn are all greater than or equal to zero, but we're going to introduce a new variable xk into our constraints and also impose the restriction that that must be a positive variable. In particular, this does have a name because what it's doing is picking up the slack that the other equation wasn't able to achieve in equality in terms of equality to bk. So this is usually what we refer to as a slack variable. Right? So every time you have a less than or equal to constraint, we can always introduce a slack variable in order to make it an equality constraint. Now, what if we have the other scenario? Suppose we have, you know, ak1 x1 plus ak2 x2 all the way out to akn xn, and let's assume that this is greater than or equal to, say, bk. So what we can do here is we can take away some of that sum to make it equal to each other. So that means we can turn this into ak1 x1 plus all the way down to, say, akm xn. Actually, let's keep this a little bit parallel. So plus ak2 ak2 x2 all the way out to akm xn and we're going to take away some value to that sum and that it will be an equality okay and what we're going to do is we're going to impose the restriction because we're taking away a positive amount so we're still going to be restricting sk to be greater than or equal to zero so again this is our constraints and this is our restricted section now, this is not a slack variable because now we're sort of taking away the surplus, right? Because originally we had too much and we take some away and now it's now going to be equal to each other. So this is referred to as a surplus variable. So every time that you have a greater than or equal to quality and you want to convert that to an equality, what you can do is introduce a surplus variable and that will take away those problems. Now, of course, this is not all of the transformations that you can perform on linear programs, but in the next video, we're actually going to take advantage of all these things and be able to show that pretty much any linear program can be represented in a very compact way. In particular, we can always represent it as f of x is equal to ctx ax is equal to zero with the restriction that x is greater than or equal to zero right where the first is our objective function our constraints and our restrictions and we'll go into details on how we can always achieve this particular form um, assuming that we don't have any you know non-linearity or stochastic processes uh, in our particular problem so we'll look at that in the next video and until then i hope you take care See you.